If you have a Bible, uh, I'd encourage you to open it to John chapter 10. We'll be going through John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. We're continuing in the Gospel of John. I had a request, a good request, and I'll do this next week if I remember to uh, put the, um, the Scripture in the bulletin for this specific week. So we'll do that for those of you who like to take notes. Uh, John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42, and the title of the message is, In the Hand of the Most High. In the Hand of the Most High. This is the word of the Lord. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? That's actually a very generous translation. The better translation in Greek would be, how long are you going to keep annoying us? Truly, that's what it says. If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Verse 25, Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Listen to that. Hear that. Hold on to that. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one, says Jesus. Pause for a moment there. Put your finger in your Bible. That verse, verse 30, I and the Father are one, has been the center of a lot of debate throughout the centuries. What does it mean that the Son and the Father are one? We don't have time to fully explore this diamond of a verse today, uh, for God has laid a different emphasis on my heart this morning, but suffice it to say that a foundational teaching of Scripture is that our God is one God, but three persons. There are places where we see them functioning as one, sharing a unified will. But that does not mean that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one person. They're still three people. They're of the same substance. They're made of God stuff. But they are not the same person. When Jesus says, I and the Father are one, we should understand that he is mostly talking about their shared will and their shared substance, their shared stuff and not so much about their identity as persons. Now, continuing on with the Scripture in verse 31. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Passive-aggressive, right? Pretty good. (laughs) For which of these do you stone me? For healing a blind man? For turning water into wine? For healing someone who's been lame for 38 years? Which of these are you going to stone me for, Jesus says? What is it that I did so wrong? Verse 33, we are not stoning you for any work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I have said that you are, quote, gods? If he called them, quote, gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father has set apart as his very own, and sent into the world. Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? One more pause. Put your finger in your Bible. This is a tricky one. This is another hotly debated passage. Jesus quotes from Psalm 86, and I'd encourage you to look it up after church if you want to discuss this a little more. I had to do a lot of head scratching in my studies for this one too. But Psalm 86, and Psalm 86 uses hyperbolic language to describe either the corrupt judges of Israel or angelic beings or the whole nation of Israel and calls them, quote, little g gods. Now, you could argue all three convincingly. Jesus' point, however, is that sometimes the Scripture uses the little g word, God, to refer to those who are put in authority to represent capital G, God. A prime example appears in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, where we read that Moses became a, quote, little g, God, to Pharaoh. 
what it says in Exodus 7.1. It might be better to translate the intent of this, not that humans can be capital G gods, none of us can become God, right? Look around, there's no God in here, except for one, the Lord, he's in here, his spirit's in here, but no, nobody's sitting in these chairs as God. Not that humans can become capital G God, but that we can be appointed by God to function on his behalf. And in that way, we are kind of stand-ins for God on earth. Human beings cannot be God, but we can serve as his ambassadors, can we not? That's basically what's going on there. It's a lot more complicated than that, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to dive into that in the message. If you want to talk more after church, I'd love to talk with you about it. It might take some coffee or a lunch this week to really get into it, but I'd love to do that. All right, that's enough egghead commentary. Continuing on in verse 37. Verse 37, Jesus says this, Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Verse 40, then Jesus went back across the Jordan. He went from Jerusalem, the center of Jewish life, to across the Jordan, outside the promised land, to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word that is everlasting. Thank you for your promises which are true and sure. Thank you for holding us in the palm of your hand. God, help me to be faithful as I execute this message today. Help me to get out of your way, speak through my failing lips. Any foolish words that come out and fall out of my mouth, help them to be rearranged by the Holy Spirit so that they can be the words that need to be heard by each ear, each heart, each mind here today. We take your word seriously, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So in verse 37, Jesus tells us plainly here, do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. He says don't believe unless I do the works of my Father. In other words, Jesus says that unless the evidence is compelling, don't believe. But if the evidence is compelling, if it is compelling, then we cannot help but believe. What evidence? The compelling evidence about Jesus is his teaching of truth along with his miraculous works of compassion and love. It is truth and love. The truth of his words and the love in his works draw us into him. Say what you want about John but he does not pad the numbers or sugarcoat the results in his gospel. In his gospel, belief is, more often than not, portrayed as the minority report. Fewer believe than don't believe. But those who do believe in this gospel are the ones who are open-minded and willing to question, like prosecutors, the lies they've been told by the world the woman at the well comes to believe because she knows she's been fed a whole lot of lies in life. Everyone, the man born blind, is fed lies by the teachers of the law who want to convince him that it was sinful for him to be healed. He doesn't believe that. He questions hard after truth, and he comes to believe. Those who do not believe refuse him basically because they are blindly in love with the dark webs that they've spun for themselves in John's gospel. By sheer force of will and deep-seated stubbornness of heart, they overrule the clear conclusion of what they have seen and what they've heard, the evidence of his works and his words that are overwhelming. They overrule that because they perceive rightly that their shabby and shallow ways, their shadowy ways, are threatened by the light God. And so we see in today's passage that those who were first, the religious leaders, the elite, they become last, don't we? The insiders become the outsiders. 
the religious elite find themselves on the out with Jesus while the Gentiles who are beyond the Jordan as out as you can get, those who literally dwell outside the promised land, find themselves in the company of God himself. The outsiders become the insiders in Christ. Amen? Amen. Those who were last, and that's every one of us, become first. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's John chapter 1, verses 11 through 12. Now that's the seminary interpretation of this passage. But I was struck by one verse in particular as I was studying. And after speaking and praying with a number of you this week, I want to focus our attention there. Look at verse 27 and 28 again. Look at verses 27 and 28. Jesus says this, My sheep listen to my voice. Do you listen to his voice? I know them. He knows you. And they follow me. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Pay particular attention to these words. No one will ever snatch them out of my hand. Do you know, do you know that you are held firmly in God's hands? Do you know that he holds you firmly? Do you know that he loves you and will never let go of you? I've shared this story many times before. If you've heard it, please forgive me. But I think it's important today. During the Korean War, Richie and Brennan, two GIs who had been friends since childhood in Irish New York, were holed up in a pillbox eating their dinner rations after a long day of fighting. Just as they were arguing over the last piece of a Hershey bar, a hand grenade came in and fell at their feet. Without hesitation, Brennan put the last piece of candy in his mouth, casually tossed aside the Hershey wrapper, and laid down on the hand grenade. Before Richie could say anything, Brennan looked up, winked at his friend, and the hand grenade went off, killing Brennan instantly but sparing Richie's life. Later, well after the war, Richie went through a period of questioning his own worth. As he often did, he paid a visit to Brennan's elderly Irish mother. And at one point in the conversation, as they sat in her parlor exchanging pleasantries, he asked her, do you think Brennan loved me? Richie. Why would you go breaking an old widow's heart now, she said. Foolishly, Richie pressed the question several more times. Do you think Brennan loved me? Do you think your son loved me, my friend from childhood? Do you think he loved me? After several uncomfortable but well-mannered attempts to dismiss Richie's insensitive line of inquiry, the widow could stand no more. She looked up at Richard, her eyes hot with tears, and shouted, and I quote, Jesus Christ, man, what more could he have done for you? Jesus Christ, man, what more could he have done for you and for me? To prove his love for us. Richie went on to take the name of Brennan as his own name, and until passing away just a few years ago, was widely known as one of the most powerful voices for the grace and love of God for a hurting world. His name was Brennan Manning, author of The Ragamuffin Gospel and Abba's Child. Do you ever wonder if God loves you? Do you ever wonder? It seems to me that we often foolishly ask ourselves whether God loves us or not, though the answer is right in front of us at the cross. Does God really love us? What could be more loving than to lay down your life for someone else? 
What more could he have done for us than to lay his life down and lay on the hand grenade of God's wrath that we deserve so that you and I might live? What more could he have done for you? What more could he have done for you? We can question theology all you want. Have at it. Question the scriptures and the church and all the saints and apostles, but never question that God loves us. Never question this. The evidence is what he did on the cross. It can never, no, never, no, never be undone. What troubles me the most as a pastor today is the prevalence of brothers and sisters, believers in Christ, children of God who question whether God loves them or not, who question their salvation, whether they're loved or not by God. Fear, fear is a powerful thing. It's the fulcrum. You know what a fulcrum is when you have a lever, you have a a point in the middle that you can wedge everything against. Fear is the fulcrum of every political, relational, religious layer of manipulation in the world. If you want to control someone, all you have to do is convince them that the sky is falling somewhere. Fear is the central component in the machinery of control. And just as our leaders use fear to manipulate us physically, so the devil uses fear to lure us from the spiritual protection of God's hand. Now, the Feast of Dedication that we talked about at the very beginning here, this is also known as Hanukkah today. It's the Feast of Dedication. It's a December holiday close to the solstice. It reminded the children of Israel every year how they were seemingly always on the precipice of being snatched away from God's protection. The fear of the religious old guard was palpable as they approached Jesus on this cold winter's day to get him to tell them once and for all if he's the Messiah. In other words, the one who will keep them from being snatched away by the Romans. That's what they're worried about. A century and a half before Jesus, Judas Maccabeus, not the Judas who betrayed Jesus, He's the hero of Hanukkah, if you don't know the Hanukkah story. A righteous Jewish man had narrowly kept their great-grandparents from being snatched away by the Syrians. Five centuries earlier, however, they had not been so fortunate. The Babylonian Empire had snatched them away into exile for almost a hundred years. The history of the Hebrews was peppered with the pain of being snatched away into exile and into slavery. And so their greatest fear was the fear of being snatched away. This deep-seated fear of being taken from God's hand was heavy on their hearts and minds, especially at the Feast of Dedication when the nights were so long and so cold. So when Jesus says, no one can snatch my sheep from my hand, he's telling them that they need not fear being snatched away by any earthly empire if they would simply seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. My brothers and sisters, as the children of God and the sheep of the great shepherd, that's what we are. We are to be a people without fear. We are to be a people without fear. We are to remain unmanipulated by the fear-mongering of politicians and social influencers today. We must be on guard against the fear induced by religion, and especially of the fears perpetuated by those who are closest to us. Sometimes our family and our spouses try to use fear as leverage to get us to be afraid, to turn away from God. We are to be a people without fear. Wait, I should revise that, actually. We are to be a people of only one fear the healthy and good fear of God who holds us within his mighty hand. Of everything else, we should have no fear. No fear. Take earthly fear away and we cannot be manipulated. This is why we're told so often in the scriptures, fear not. Anybody ever read that in the Bible? About a million times. Or do not be terrified. Again, about a million times. And be not afraid. This is the message of God to us. Do not be afraid. Walk with me and you're okay. 
And the apex of this teaching in 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, John says, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears has not been made perfect in love. He says that if we have been made perfect in Christ, not because we're perfect, but because he washes us white as snow, we have no need to fear. Not punishment, not anything the world can bring. We're people of one fear, and that's the fear of God. And that's the beginning of wisdom. So the most common fear I see among my brothers and sisters in Christ is the fear that they will be forsaken by God. In other words, so many are mistaken and afraid that we can be snatched out of God's hand, or worse, that God will cast us aside. So I want to share three truths from Scripture that I hope will purge this lie from our thinking. And I want to invite you on this journey with me, because I struggle with fear from time to time. But then I'm reminded when I pray, when I join in fellowship, when I worship, when I spend time in God's Word, I'm reminded that I need not fear. So first, the first truth is that God will never take us out of His hand. The second is that the devil can never take us out of God's hand. And third, the only ones who can take us out of God's hand is ourselves. First, God will never take us out of His hand. Jesus promises us that God will preserve those who believe in Him. While God has the power to take us out of His hand, He does not have the will to do so. God could take us out of His hand, but He chooses not to. Why? Because He loves you. He cares about you. He wants to hang out with you. And He wants to hang out with everybody in this room. He wants to hang out with you. He wants to be with you because nothing brings him more pleasure than to be in love and in relationship with you. God has the power to take us out of his hand, but he doesn't have the will to do so. In fact, he wills just the opposite. God desires to hold each of us closely as beloved children. We must never think that God wants to expel us from his hand. Amen? Second, the devil can never take us out of God's hand. The devil can never take us out of God's hands. C.S. Lewis famously wrote, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And we see that in the church. Scripture after scripture reveals that the devil is real, but is powerless before God. While spiritual forces of evil have been granted limited power on earth, their strength is no match for God's strength. Thinking the devil can pull us from God's hand would be like thinking a newborn baby could wrestle Andre the giant and win. It's just not possible. The devil's not that strong. He can't take you from God's hand. A Christian who clings to the promises of Scripture, who clings to the promises of Scripture, is utterly unafraid of the devil because we know he is a loser without any future. His only means of manipulation is to try to get us to doubt God's love for us by whispering in our ears lies. Lies of fear, lies of shame and regret. Oh, that's a doozy. That's a doozy. Regret. I'm not sure which is worse, regret over the things that we've done or regret over the things we haven't done. But I do know that what my good friend and pastor Scott Archer says is true. The devil wants to define you by your past. He wants to shame you into thinking you're unworthy, into walking away from God's love by your past. But we are not defined by our past. We are defined by God. We are who He says we are, not what anyone else, not the devil. We are who He says we are, not what anyone else says we are. We must not listen to the lies of the devil that are designed to get us to walk away from God. We have been given authority to overcome those lies. Luke 10, 19, Jesus says to his disciples, which is you, he says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome 
all the power of the enemy and nothing shall harm you. He has given you, Paul, authority. He has given you, Sherry, authority. Jody, you have been given authority. Aureli, you have been given authority. Quinn, you have been given authority. Everyone here, he has given authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. If that isn't enough for you, Romans 8, 37 through 39 says this, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And again in James 4, 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he might flee. Resist the devil and he'll think about fleeing. No, what, what does it say? It says resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee. You have authority, my friend. He cannot take you out of God's hand. He cannot take you out of God's hand. We are not powerless, friends. God has given us all the power we need to overcome all the power of the enemy. We simply must take our stand and resist him when he whispers those lies of shame and regret and fear in our ears. The devil is just a buzzing fly. And we can swat him away anytime with the authority given to us by God. You should learn those scriptures by heart because every time you're tempted to think about the past and think about shame and regret, you need to say, Satan, I'm going to dance on your head. I have been given authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of you. Nothing will harm me and nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know those verses? Friends, you get to know them. If you struggle with doubt, if you struggle with questioning your salvation, learn Romans 8, 37 through 39. Learn James 4, 7. Resist him and he must flee. So first, God will not take us out of his hand. Second, the devil cannot take us out of his hand. And third, the only one who can take us out of God's hand is ourselves. There's an old school word for this, and I'm going to use it, and you'll probably think I'm, you might tune me out as soon as I say it. The word is apostasy, apostasy. It's a theological term. It basically means outside status, outside apa, outside and stasis status, apostasy. It basically means saying, I'm out, I'm out. Now, we could get into a big vortex of debate about predestination and foreknowledge and how all that works, but again, that's way more than just a Sunday sermon. But even those who wrote the most troubling scriptures on predestination, that would include John, by the way, are those who, are, they are clear that those who, are, who simply walk away from belief, there are those who walk away from belief. They're not cast away by God, and they're not snatched away by the devil, they simply choose to walk away of their own free will. John 6, 66, which I think is kind of a wink from whoever broke out those verses there. John 6, 66 is a verse where we read about the crowds who left Jesus when his teachings got uncomfortable. Remember he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you won't see the kingdom of God. And then everybody goes, apostasy, I'm out, <laughs> I'm out. God didn't snatch, God didn't throw them away. The devil didn't snatch them away. They chose to leave. And then there's Judas, one of the 12, the 12 closest who walked away. Paul, John, Peter, and James all indicate in their letters that there are those and others who choose to leave the faith of their own accord. It does happen. Apostasy is possible. But in all of these, not one is dumped by God. Not one is dumped by God and not one is stolen by the devil. It is always a matter of their own choosing. So that leaves us just one question. How do we know if we've taken ourselves out of his hand? If God won't do it and the devil can't do it, how do we know if we've taken ourselves out of God's hand? 
This is where I want to be a little pastorally caring here. This is the question so many of my brothers and sisters stumble over, and you know who you are here today. Many fall into the error of thinking that suffering and persecution are the evidence that they are no longer held safely in God's hand. When the going gets tough, they think, God must have abandoned me. I've been forsaken by God. This is a lie. Suffering and persecution are not only possible in the life of a believer, but they are practically promised. They are practically promised by Jesus. We may think that God has forsaken us when we experience suffering, but suffering is not abandonment. They are two different things. Indeed, some suffering is evidenced is evidence of God's Father love for us. As Hebrews 12, 6 reminds us, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Just as a lousy father would never discipline his children, if God did not love us, he would never discipline us. Suffering is not the evidence of abandonment by God. If you're wondering if God has left you or if you've walked away from God because there's suffering in your life, stop worrying about that. Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you might have trouble? No. What does he say? In this world, you, world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I am not letting you out of my hand. Another lie that many believers fall prey to is that experiencing temptation means that we've left God's hand. Nothing could be further from the truth, my friends. Did you know Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, was tempted? Temptation is not evidence that you've left God's hand. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Temptation is something we all deal with. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will always provide a way out so that you can endure it. Excuse me, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Being tempted to sin is a part of life. Is a part of life. No one can avoid being tempted. And don't let the devil rub your nose in it when you're tempted. And point out how terrible you are and how you've abandoned it, God. No. Temptation is a part of life. No one can avoid being tempted. I once heard the difference between temptation and sin put this way. You can't stop a bird from flying overhead. You just can't stop that. But you can keep it from building a nest in your hair or your beard, I suppose. Regardless, my friends, we need not think we have taken ourselves out of God's hands merely because we've been tempted to sin. We are all tempted. We're here in fellowship to keep building one another up and helping one another to stand. We're not here to pretend we're not tempted. We are all sinners saved by grace, aren't we? Anybody here not a sinner? Good, you wouldn't fit in very well if you weren't. (laughs) That leaves a further question, though. This is where it gets tricky. What about when we do give in to temptation and when we do commit sin? Are we taking ourselves out of God's hands then? Are we taking ourselves out of God's hands when we sin? This is where intent comes into play. It's important to make the distinction between missing the mark unintentionally and missing the mark volitionally, intentionally, presumptuously choosing to sin. Did you know that the word for sin in Greek, it's hamartia, it's actually an archery term? What does sin have to do with archery? It's an archery term. It means to miss the mark, to miss the bullseye. That's what it means, to miss the bullseye. In that respect, any shot that falls short of a perfect bullseye is missing the mark. It's sin, which makes sense. God has this ideal he wants us to live up to, and we never quite do it. Sometimes we get it, but it doesn't seem to last very long. Now, there's a huge difference between someone who's doing their best to aim for the bullseye but misses the mark. There's a difference between that and someone who intentionally aims away from the bullseye and tries to see how far they can drift off course and chooses to avoid hitting the target. In the same way, our aim matters. If we are aiming to do what is right, but we fall short, that's forgivable 
And you know, it's covered by grace. Grace is the distance between the bullseye and wherever we land when we ask for forgiveness. That's all grace is. God says, eh, I'll give you to you. I love you. Do better. Go and sin no more. <laughs> it's forgivable and covered by grace if we're trying to aim. But if we intentionally aim the wrong way, purposefully choosing to miss the mark out of habit, God isn't fooled. God isn't fooled by that. If I could speak any comfort to you this morning, my friends, it is this. To many of you who have shared with me your private struggles with temptation and sin, you wonder whether you're still held in God's hand. This is the word for you. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all. How much? All unrighteousness. As my friend Rod Brown used to say, the Greek word for all is all. <laughs> he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Nothing Nothing can separate you from love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. No one can snatch us up out of his hand. If we own up to our sins and ask his forgiveness, he says, my grace, it's sufficient for you. Your heart has been released. Your heart's free at last. Go and sin no more. Let us remain firmly planted in the palm of his hand. Let us remember what Jesus said, no one can snatch you out of my hand. Let's come before the Lord this morning in prayer. And let's confess to him the areas where we've missed the mark. Let's also confess to him that we've doubted sometimes. We've given in to fear and to shame and regret in a way that's derailed us from where he wants us to be. And let's ask God to put us back where we need to be. Let's also confess to the Lord that sometimes we've doubted whether he loves us. What more could he have done for you than the cross? Let's pray. Let's bring these things to God. And let's go from here this morning filled with a sense of security in our salvation in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being with us this morning, for every heart that is here, for every heart that's been aching, to know that you love us to know that your plans are not derailed by our disobedience, to know that you have a purpose for us even now, even still, even after all this time. God, forgive us for doubting your love. How foolish it is to ask, do you really love me, Lord, when you say with your arms stretched wide, beaten and bloody for us, what more could I do for you? Yes, Lord, you do love us. You do love us. Thank you. Lord, thank you for preserving us from the devil, from evil. We know that if we ask and if we resist the devil, he has to flee. We have been given authority, and thank you for that authority. Help us to walk in it and to dance on Satan's head. And finally today, Lord, for those of us that have gotten into presumptuous sin, have doubted your call, have walked away, God, would you help us to come back? Would you help us to be reminded it's never, ever, ever too late. It is not too late. Your grace, if we confess our sins, your grace, you are faithful and just, your grace to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We come before you, God, today, longing to be made new. And we hear your voice. I hear you saying it right now, Jesus. You're saying, yes, let's go. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Be with each one here. Amen. Would you stand with me for the benediction? If you're a visitor here today,